Hello, we're at the uh, Cardiometabolic Risk Summit here in Las Vegas, Nevada in uh, 2014, October. I'm here with Dr. Eileen O'Grady, and uh, Dr. O'Grady just gave a, a, an excellent talk talking about all the behavioral things that we need to think about with the cardiometabolic risk syndrome. And there were a couple of fascinating questions. One of them I thought was interesting because you're a coach. So how do you become a coach? Is there a certification program? So would you want to answer that? Yeah, great. Well, coaching is a bit like the Wild West right now, where we have uh, lots of people calling themselves coaches, lots of programs popping up. Um, and I would recommend going to a program that leads to International Coaching Federation credential. They have uh, well-developed competencies and a pretty rigorous exam um, process to uh, declare a coach competent. Um, I also myself went through Well Coaches and really liked that program and uh, became a wellness coach through them and then went to Mentor Coach based in Rockville and, um, and became a life coach. So there's many, many programs. Those are the ones that I know and recommend. And I would just make sure um, that it leads to ICF uh, credentialing. Thank you for that answer. The other thing I'm thinking of, Eileen, is as I was listening to you, okay, as a physician, as a clinician, I try, you know, this is all human behavior and there are obstacles and barriers. So what do you think as far as physicians go? We'll stick with physicians because we're the ones that I think create the most barriers. And, and I'm thinking, because we think of barriers in patients, but I like to talk about clinician barriers. What can I do to help cut down the barriers and help communication, help people change? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a lot of promises, a great question, in, in group visits, actually. And actually, there's been some evidence that uh, peer-led groups, people that have been very successful in managing and lowering the risk of their uh, metabolic syndrome, um, having different providers come in, provider groups, and letting the peer process work. Um, that's, that's one thing for sure, and I know that there's some movement to get built. So in other words, don't take it over, let other people talk. Y yes, exactly, <laughs> and, and particularly the patients, yes. yes. Um, and, and also, you know, having more options that, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of results with executive coaching in the executive world and bringing that into the healthcare. We're seeing and reading a lot uh -huh. more about health coaches and having more tools available, exactly. So you're, you're also saying that probably I, as a physician, am a health coach. Well, you, you, you know, if you move more to inquiry and less telling, absolutely. Ah, yes. so doctors tell a lot rather than ask, right? Yes, uh, playing the role of expert we, we know doesn't really, you know, coming in with all the answers right. um, doesn't really work. But, you know, we were taught that way, and that's the way, you know, if it is to be, it's up to me, it's 3 a.m., we're the ones who make the decision. So how do I change? How do I change and still feel good about myself? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of times you can make your... Um, you know, uh, comment into a question, <laughs> um, and and it's give me an it's example an exercise. Um, let's see. So if somebody's you know on a weight loss journey, you can ask them. You know, what is it that you're doing that's causing this this condition? What are you? What specific behaviors are you doing that's causing you to be overweight? And the answer is not oh I eat too much. It's because I, I don't eat all day and I binge at night. I do a lot of nighttime binging. I'm addicted to sugar. There's any range of answers. Well, so, I have trouble getting that out of people. Should I ask them specifically? Do you think things like nighttime binging cause the problem? You could offer a range of options that might be in, in their okay. way. And there has to be trust and, and some ah. real trust in that relationship that they're going to open up to. This okay. doesn't. How do I know when there's trust in the relationship? Well, when they start to share intimate things, ah. there has to be space. There has to be real concern and interest and curiosity okay. in that person. Um, I think approaching people with curiosity is probably the number one. Okay. When you say sharing intimacy, you quickly start saying they're sharing their sex life. But I'm sure you mean more than no. that. I mean, for somebody to tell you that they're eating a box of Cheez-Its for dinner, um, that requires intimacy. Okay. Or they're eating, you know, a half of a sheet cake. Um, that, that's not something that really gets... Um, you know, they're, they're not going to, that might be the first time they're saying something out loud, and that's the beginning of the change process, just to get them to start uh, saying Okay, and what I think I'm hearing there is that they're not afraid to tell me that. They're not thinking I'm going to come back, you did what? Right, exactly. So that they trust me. Yes, unconditional positive regard and radical acceptance is the approach. Now, Excellent. And, and um, people are doing all kinds of disordered eating in this country. We're all living in a toxic food environment. It's everywhere. And I say that unless you have a plan going forward, particularly around eating, you will be overweight. It, it is that easy to have. All right, so it's toxic eating, mm -hmm. and you're afraid to share it. Mm -hmm. all right, do you think there's a biological reason for the toxic eating? 
Or is that all psychological? Yeah, I mean, sometimes people are not. It depends, and sometimes people are eating to their 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 boss with the relationship with their boss or their spouse. They're eating to things. They're eating to soothe, eating to numb out. I mean, that that can absolutely be right. uh, the case. Sometimes it's knowledge. They they think that you know eating. Um, Cereal in the morning, um, or you know, muffins is a good thing, and right. so so some some of it. It's but it's often not education. It's often there's an emotional underpinning to it. So it seemed like I should be asking questions like, when you eat certain foods, do you feel they make you feel better? Mm -hmm. Would that be a good question to ask? Yeah. Well, or does it hold you? So so part of the thing you know with breakfast especially is does it hold you? So um, people are eating a lot of you know junk food, but it's not satisfying. So one of the the, the things that I do is have people eat beautiful food. Um, in variety, and they have to actually spend more money than they ever had right, before. That you should right. be eating beautiful food that anyone watching you would be jealous of. What's um, beautiful? Well, you know, eating um, you know a, a piece of beautifully prepared steak with some beautiful salad on ah, the side, or okay. some Brussels sprouts, where it's colorful and it's appealing and it's and it's pleasing. And, and okay. if you're vegetarian, there's options as well. So that the food has a lot of variety. Um, you know, it's just junk food. We all right. know it doesn't feel good and it doesn't hold you. It doesn't. Cause at all, it, it lasts very short, and then you're okay. hungry. So, it sounds like what you're teaching them is value of food, teaching them why they eat, mm -hmm. and then it's helping me as a clinician know how I might discuss it with them. Yeah, I mean, food is very sensuous, right? Uh -huh. And we get these messages, and that you know, if you want to go on a weight loss journey, it's learning how to relate to food differently. To me, it's about getting that relationship right, and and that's why I often don't bring in exercise until people are down right. 40, 50 pounds, and then they start saying very organically, "Eileen, right. I'm ready to start moving." Oh, good. And so it's they're not co-equal. It's all about the eating. You can't exercise your way out of 100 pounds. It's all about getting in right relationship right. with food and eating beautiful, healthy food, real food and relating to it in that okay. way. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you on that. Okay. You're saying I wait till they lost 40 pounds before I start any type of exercise? Okay. So I would never, ever tell anybody not to exercise. That is not what I would, right. that's not right. the message. But if someone's coming to me and they um, are desperate to lose weight, that the exercise and, and the uh, eating are not co-equal. Uh -huh. um, there's a disordered eating pattern going on. So laser being focusing on that. And what we know about goal setting and willpower is that it weakens over time. Uh -huh. So if we add too many things at once, uh, it'll fail. Okay. So to set up for success is we're going to get your eating straightened out. And then one, once that's successful and on the way, we never bring up food again after okay. the first couple of weeks. It, they've got it. They're doing okay. it. And then we start addressing the spouse, the boss, the, the exercise, those other things, bringing okay. things in. So, okay, great. so hear me on that. There is nothing better you can do for yourself than to exercise every day. And, um, you know, and that's not something that's going to happen, you know, overnight. Sure. No, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of wisdom there, Dr. Grady. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much Thanks for, for having being me. here. It's great to be here. Okay. Thank you.